Good morning chaps and chapettes. Today's video was a request from our Discord channel. Can we do a video on the AT-1? And that's not the Nuffield Assault Tank one, but the Amphibious Tank number one, also known as the Braithwaite Amphibious Tank. The origins of the AT-1 stem back to the last months of 1940. The UK had been booted out of France and was back at home licking its wounds and preparing for an invasion from Germany. And so it might seem unusual that they were looking at building amphibious tanks for open sea use when the vast majority of its enterprise was on defence over that of offence. Despite the fact that the UK was indeed preparing itself for an invasion, it had not entirely given up on the notion of striking back. Yet any counter-invasion would be amphibious, and the British had no tanks suitable for this purpose. It had of course vehicles that could cross rivers and lakes, but nothing that could cross open seas with moderate swell at the time. As a result of this deficiency, the War Office made a request on the 5th of August 1940 to investigate the possibility of designing a tank that could be launched by ship, a reasonable distance from the shore, able to operate under its own power and fight the minute it landed. The requirement was passed to the DNLE, or the Director of Naval Land Equipment, in August 1940, and plans began to be drawn up in September the same year based at the Adelphi Hotel in London, in the same building as the TOG engineers were based. The team chosen consisted of a Mr E.C. Pound, a W.F. Hurst, a naval architect, Mr. E. Bird, a mechanical engineer, along with Mr. Tut, Young and Cordry as draftsmen. These chaps have been working on the Cultivator No. 6 machine, better known as the Nellies, a play on the letters Naval Land Equipment. These giant machines would be semi-buried and dig a trench towards the enemy lines, wide and deep enough for the infantry and even tanks to follow, while being hidden from incoming fire. Once it reached the enemy lines, it would emerge and form a large ramp to allow the following soldiers and vehicles to spill out into the enemy's defensive lines. Although based in the same building, they are perhaps more infamous for stealing TOGS engines, the Paxman Ricardo TP-12 600 horsepower, leaving the project essentially scuppered while they hoofed it away with their shiny new loot for their fancy mole machine. Work on the vehicle proceeded quickly, and by November the 1st, the first plans were drawn up and forwarded to the War Office in the Admiralty, simply called AT-1, which were then sent back with alterations to be made. Notably, the 165 brake horsepower engine was to be replaced by a 250 horsepower DAV Meadows flat engine, and a proposed rear-mounted turret was removed. Other changes which were listed included a larger gearbox and a three-man turret to be replaced with a two-man turret, along with improvements in the running gear, with springing added to the tracks. The original proposal was only sprung by rubber rollers, which had been tested and found unsatisfactory on TOG-1. As four tanks were required for preliminary trials, it was decided that two tanks would have just sprung front rollers and be designated AT-1 star while the other two would have all sprung suspension with parts stolen from Churchill tanks and be designated 81 2 star with the former at 30 tonnes and the latter at 31 tonnes. With these modifications, it was then down to who would build the vehicle. Initially, the request went to Vickers at Barrow. However, they were told it would take 12 months for them to build the four tanks and they were not overly keen to take the project on. They designed one light amphibious tank, which used extensive use of aluminium and had virtually no armour. After inspections of the plans, it was declared as utterly useless by General Martel anyway. Therefore, the War Office chose to use Braithwaite's of Newport, in Wales, and their Neptune works. Braithwaite's were chosen as they specialised in making large water tanks, and therefore had the experience of working with water, steel and buoyancy as well as the staff and machinery to do so, and were near a large stretch of estuary to test the device. The 81 tanks were made with a special quality plating to resist the corrosive effect of seawater, and used a riveted construction with caulking at all joints. 
A raised combing was riveted to the top deck of the tank, which incorporated the hood of the driver's compartment, and was used to mount the turret along with the air inlet and exit trunks. The main hull was split into four compartments, the driver's compartment to the front, the fighting compartment, the engine section, and the rear gearbox compartment, each separated by watertight hatches. The driver had two watertight hatches above him, and a large one behind him. Below the driver's seat was a seacock he could operate. This would flood the ballast tanks on landing to give the tracks extra purchase. The central fighting compartment was entered via the turret top and was fully rotating. Below the turret basket was space for additional rounds, as well as an auxiliary gearbox which was powered by the main engine and would operate the bilge pumps and traverse the turret. The turret itself was that of a cruiser Mark V Covenanter tank with the same 2 pounder gun, 7.92mm Beezer and smoke launchers. It's worth noting that this vehicle was not an amphibious Covenanter, rather just a Covey turret on a new hull. An extra Bren on a Lakeman mount was used for AA defence. The engine was separated by a bulkhead with two watertight doors. Behind this was a Meadows DAV 12 cylinder horizontally opposed engine with a governed speed of 2400 rpm, developing 285 brake horsepower. To either side of the engine and the gearbox were the petrol tanks. Large cowlings covered the air inlet and exit valves to stop any sea spray and oddly an emergency escape hatch was situated in the engine decks although accessing this from the turret would have required extreme flexibility in a rush. Two gearboxes were tested. The 81 Star had a Meadows 4-speed gearbox with 2-speed final reduction, cross-drive and used Wilson steering units. The 81 Two Star used a 4-speed synchro self-shifting gearbox and with a 2-speed final reduction drive with differential regenerative steering which was somewhat more problematic. The hull itself was large enough to give the vehicle the buoyancy required and consisted of a sectional double hulled arrangement. This was done to keep the vehicle afloat even if the hull was pierced or damaged, followed by an inner armoured layer which with the gaps and multiple plates actually offered the vehicle much more effective armour than the land based cruiser tanks. The inner armoured plate was between 40 to 52 mm over the front, behind the double layered skins but only 13mm at the sides and 6 on the decks. Each vehicle had a five-man crew, consisting of a commander, gunner, loader, driver and one extra hand in the fighting compartment. It's not clear how many were built exactly, but it seems that four at least were made. Trials took place in the North Dock, Newport in early 1942 and further trials at Barry Island between April and October of 1942 by the NLE team. These trials were not promising. The vehicle had excessive yaw and shear and simply could not be steered due to her large size and lack of forward momentum, being powered by her tracks only. A wooden model was then made with twin fins and rudders and tested at the Navy's experimental water tank at Hasler in Gosport and given the name 81 Three Star. This vehicle, the last of its type, had a slightly different Triple S gearbox and was sent to Chertsey for testing. However, the gearbox exploded, causing significant damage to the vehicle. The 81 was also found to be difficult in exiting the sea, a problem that would also occur on the later, and some would say equally useless, Narctex. In order to get enough traction, the driver had to get to the shoreline, then pull up the stopcock and flood the front half of the tank which would lower her buoyancy and allow the tracks to gain traction on the seabed. But this also added in a few tons of water, which then had to drain out as she was trying to climb up a shingle beach. In 1942, the DNLE was overtaken by the AFV directorate and it was decided no more work would be done on these machines. Three were sent to Curran's Ironwork in Cardiff, where they were presumably scrapped. A fourth remains missing and was allegedly sent to the US, but no trace has been found of it. Well guys, I hope you like the look of one of these more unusual and uglier amphibians of the UK in the World War II. For a nation surrounded by water, it has a pretty terrible track record of making floating vehicles. If you did like this vid, 
give us a like, a share, and come and join us on our Discord channel. And until next time, toodle pip.